This is going to be our last um, body system for AP151. Uh, we're talking about the urinary system. Now, as we're discussing the urinary system, it is very important that you go back and review some lab concepts um, and concepts from earlier in the class. Specifically, you need to remember the concepts of diffusion, although we've been working with that in the cardiovascular system and respiratory system. But you also need to understand osmosis. And I've given you my shorthand way of understanding it um, uh, very briefly. As I'm thinking about osmosis, I always think of water as wanting to follow a solute. So if I want water to go from this side of a membrane to that side of a membrane, if I move solute over to the other side, then water will want to follow it. That's the way I think of osmosis. No, actually, I think of water as being like a dog and solutes being like a ball. And if you want the dog to go somewhere, you just throw the ball and the dog chases it. But you know, that's me, okay? Um, so make sure you review your understanding of osmosis and hypertonic and hypotonic and, um, and make sure that you're comfortable thinking about those things. Also, I want you to review your understanding of active transport. Remember, the cells of the body will use active transport when we want to move any ion or solute against the direction of its concentration gradient. In other words, whenever we want to move a solute from where it is less abundant to where it is more abundant, we will use active transport. So remember osmosis and review those ideas. Now, if you ask a whole bunch of people, what does the kidney do? All of them will say this, uh, it gets rid of waste, there it is, eliminates waste, all right? But you'll notice on this slide that the function of the kidney, eliminating waste is an important thing that it does, but it is not the only important thing that it does. Your kidneys are important for so much more than just eliminating waste. Let's start at the top. Your kidney is responsible for, for a lot of the homeostasis that happens in your body. The homeostasis of temperature, no, okay? But keeping your blood and all of the fluids in your body that we call interstitial fluids, uh, all the fluids that are around your cells, keeping those at a perfect pH, that's the job of the kidneys, primarily the job of the kidneys, right? We, we'll talk about that in more detail. Keeping the osmolarity of your body fluids exactly in the right spot, that is also the job of your kidneys. And by the way, your kidneys are the only part of your body that can do this. Um, it is important that all the fluids of your body be isotonic to the healthy concentration of solutes inside of your cells, right? If we want your, all of your cells to be happy, we've got to make sure that the fluid around them is isotonic. If the fluid around them is hypertonic, it sucks water out of them and the cells die. If it is the fluid around is hypotonic, water goes in, the cells pop, the cells die, right? So osmolarity is regulated by your kidneys. The total volume of your blood is regulated by your kidneys. Now, when we think about blood volume, I'm not sure what you're thinking of, but it's true that blood volume kind of has got two parts. Blood volume has got the part that is cells. That is regulated by the kidneys also. The kidneys don't make the cells, but they secrete erythropoietin that dictates how many red blood cells the bone marrow is making. But when I say blood volume, I'm mostly thinking about the watery component of the blood. If your blood volume or your blood pressure are too low, the kidney will step in and take action. So these are really important. Um, if your kidneys are not working very well, then uh, removing the waste product is actually not the most important thing that we need to step in and maintain. Uh, I already mentioned one of the hormones that the kidneys uh, makes and secretes is called erythropoietin. 
Erythropoietin, often abbreviated EPO, is the hormone that the kidney cells will release when they decide they're not getting enough oxygen. If they're not getting enough oxygen, they will make more erythropoietin. The target cells for erythropoietin are found in the red marrow of the bones. And when erythropoietin meets those target cells, those target cells will be faster at making red blood cells. So more red blood cells are made per day. You get more red blood cells, theoretically you get more oxygen. The kidneys are also responsible for, for releasing renin. Renin, we talked about once so far because it was part of our discussion of blood pressure in our discussion of the cardiovascular system. We're going to come back and talk about it in more detail. So yeah. Uh, the kidney also detoxifies free radicals. There are these waste products that your metabolism creates that if they're allowed to run free in the cells, they will damage lots of proteins and they will also damage your DNA. Your body's got to get rid of them. And your kidney is a very important place for your body to take those free radicals and make them into a harmless form. There are quite a number of drugs or pharmaceutical items that are detoxified by your kidneys. Um, not every drug that you take is detoxified by the kidneys, but there are quite a number of them. And they are very important from a medical point of view. Um, I probably you haven't thought about it yet, but have you ever wondered why some antibiotics we have to take three times a day, some antibiotics we just take twice a day, some antibiotics you can get away with once a day? What's up with that, right? Well, the idea is we want to make it so that you've got enough of the antibiotic present in your blood so that it can have an effect. And we know that there is a rate at which those antibiotics are going to go away. How do they go away? Some get metabolized by the liver. Some of them get metabolized by the kidney. So if I've got an antibiotic that goes in, but very quickly it leaves, then I've got to make sure you get another dose that is going to overlap so that we constantly have an adequate amount of the drug in your bloodstream. Right? If you've got a drug that's being metabolized by the kidney, then when you've got a patient that has significant dysfunction of their kidneys, their kidneys aren't working well, then you may need to decrease how frequently the patient gets that drug. For example, um, uh, there might be a dosage of two pills three times a day. But if you've got a patient with kidney dysfunction, two pills three times a day, for the first couple of days it'll be okay, but the drug will start to build up in their bloodstream every day because their kidneys are not good at getting rid of it, and you will end up with an overdose in that patient. So there are many drugs that you will uh, decide what is the proper dosage for your patient, depending on what their kidney function is. Right. And finally, the kidney does filter your blood plasma, and it is going to take the watery part of the plasma. You know, we learned that plasma has got significant proteins in it, like fibrinogen, like albumin, right? Uh, antibodies. Uh, Plasma's got those things, but plasma is mostly water and other solutes. Uh, all of the water and other solutes that are in plasma, not the proteins, they all will go piling into these structures in the kidney called nephrons. And then it's up to the kidney to find whatever is useful in that, put it back in the bloodstream, and then whatever is waste, allow the waste to leave. Now, when it comes to waste products, the kidney is particularly important for removing what are known as nitrogenous wastes. Nitrogenous waste. Nitrogenous waste, that's the kidney's job. Okay. So what are nitrogenous wastes? Well, um, let me first start by saying that nitrogenous wastes are waste products that have nitrogen in them. So, Nitrogenous waste sounds fancy, but it just means these are biomolecules that have got nitrogen in them. And when they have nitrogen in them, we're not capable of exhaling them. So we need a different way to get rid of them. And the way humans get rid of them is through the kidneys. 
Uh, these are the four main nitrogenous wastes. The four main nitrogenous wastes are ammonia, urea, oops, uric acid, and creatinine. Okay? Those are the four main nitrogenous wastes. Let's start with ammonia. We don't have very much ammonia in our bloodstream normally, but it's not because the body doesn't make a lot of ammonia every day. Where does ammonia come from? Whenever proteins have reached the end of their life, they get broken down into amino acids. When those amino acids, when they're kind of getting shaggy, so the body says, eh, I'm not going to build a new protein with that amino acid, I'm not going to recycle it. Then they get broken down. And when they get broken down, uh, most of the molecule gets used for energy by the mitochondria, but using an amino acid in the mitochondrion for energy is going to produce this molecule, um, ammonia, okay? Now, ammonia is wickedly toxic. Like, it's crazy toxic. A very small amount of ammonia in your bloodstream will damage a lot of what's going on in your body, but the first place that we notice it in our patients is they will quit being able to think clearly. They also will smell funny. They'll, they'll smell like ammonia, right? So it doesn't take very much ammonia to dramatically uh, cause symptoms in the brain. Um, ammonia is often used in cleaning products um, and it's really toxic. You definitely wouldn't want to drink it, right? Now, we make a lot of ammonia every day, but we don't have very much ammonia in our blood. And the reason we don't have much ammonia in our blood is because our liver is going, hmm. what happened? Because our liver is going to convert the ammonia to a molecule called urea, right? And urea is the most abundant of the nitrogenous wastes. Whenever you're looking at a patient's blood test, blood urea nitrogen, or sometimes it'll say BUN, um, that is going to be the biggest number out of these things that we measure in a patient's blood test. By the way, probably every time in your life you've ever gotten a blood test, they measured how much urea was in your blood and how much creatinine was in your blood. Maybe not ure uric acid, but urea and creatinine uh, pretty much every time. So uh, here's an important thing. When ammonia builds up in the bloodstream, then it will create uh, problems thinking, which will look like um, someone's gotten demented, maybe someone's on drugs, uh, or maybe they're mentally ill. That's one thing. Another thing is, it's the liver's job to take ammonia and convert it to urea. So if there is a patient whose liver is not working well, then one of the symptoms can be that they start acting crazy. And the reason can be that if a patient's liver quits working well, then all the ammonia that their body makes in a day can't be converted to urea. And so ammonia will build up in the bloodstream. We're gonna come back to that concept in a little bit. Okay. But let's talk a little bit about creatinine. Creatinine is another very important marker of how well your kidneys are working. And it comes from creatine phosphate. We actually didn't talk about creatine phosphate when we were talking about muscles. But creatine phosphate is a very important molecule inside of your skeletal muscle. And creatine phosphate is kind of holding on to phosphates to make it much more efficient for your mitochondria to make the ATP molecules that are the energy for muscular contraction. So the more muscle mass a patient has, the more creatine phosphate they have, and the more creatine their body will make in a day. Uh, uric acid comes from the breakdown of DNA and RNA. And uric acid, when it builds up, in the bloodstream, uric acid can cause a really painful uh, inflammation of the joints known as gout, G-O-U-T, gout. All right, we're going to pick up here at dis the discussion of renal failure at the next video.